Thanks to Linode for supporting this episode of SciShow. You can go to linode.com slash scishow to learn more and get a $100 60-day credit on a new Linode account. A lot of us think about science as a narrow, top-down process where there are scientists and there are not scientists. Scientists wear white coats, work in labs, write a bunch of papers, and then teach the rest of the non-scientists about it in a way that only someone with a degree in science could do. But there are a lot more ways that we can study the world around us and produce important knowledge. Often, indigenous tribes, citizen scientists, volunteers, or just everyday people living their lives and looking around them play a crucial role in driving academic inquiry. And sometimes they're even the ones making these discoveries way before the researchers do. So here are five instances where people just like you and me beat the scientists at their own game. When it comes to collecting observational data on certain species of birds, YouTube creators have a feather in their cap. There's a group of birds called tits. Yes, really. And tits build their nests using animal fur from a variety of sources, with one study finding that tit nests contained fur from more than 20 species. The Fur is a great insulator to keep their nests warm, and it may strengthen the nests structurally or even deter predators or parasites. But until recently, no one had looked into how these birds collected that hair. Since researchers were fairly sure none of these birds were also barbers, they assumed that the birds were gathering the fur from ground sheddings or from animal carcasses, since doing so is low risk and high, hairy reward. However, it turns out that not only were these birds sourcing their furs from live animals, but the evidence that they do so has been available for years. A search on YouTube will pop up with dozens of videos of birds diving down and pulling hair directly from live animals, some of which were posted as far back as 2012. Often, these videos show birds stealing fur from sleeping dogs and cats, and sometimes from potential predators like foxes and raccoons. Most interesting of all, some show them stealing hair directly off of humans' heads, and some of them were even willing participants. Which, if you ask me, is kind of taking the whole sharing is caring idea a little bit too far. But videos like this inspired a group of researchers to classify this behavior within the academic literature. They named the practice kleptotrichy, which comes from the Greek words klepto, to steal, and trick, Hair. While this may not be the first time anecdotal evidence has led to academic publications, it's the only one we know of where YouTube played a key role in the process. Now, social media and video sharing websites aren't the only ways that people have documented nature before researchers could get to it. As meteorologists have gotten better at predicting the occurrence of auroras, more people have been able to take up aurora hunting as a hobby, armed with high-resolution cameras to document what they see. Starting in 2015, photographers on the hunt for the Northern Lights in Alberta started started noticing an unexpected pattern in the dancing lights. Instead of typical ribbons of green, blue, yellow, or purple light, these strange patterns look like long, skinny columns of mauvish light, sometimes accompanied by several short dashes of green. Although these were appearing on nights where auroras were more likely to occur, the photographers didn't think that they were the same as a regular aurora. These funky lights looked more like something called proton auroras, which are more likely to occur at lower latitudes, but are almost impossible to spot with the naked eye. So these photographers concluded that since these were neither true auroras nor proton auroras, the light show needed its own name. And since the new phenomenon had no official name, the citizen scientists decided to call the arc simply Steve. Hey, you try naming a brand new astronomical phenomenon. Eventually, one of these photographers showed these pictures of Steve, uh, no, not that Steve, these pictures of Steve, to researchers at NASA, and they launched a series of investigations aimed at determining what exactly this beam of light was. It turns out that Steve is, in part, the end product of a long chain reaction between the Sun and the Earth's magnetic field. Generally, auroras form when charged particles from the Sun collide with gases in the upper atmosphere, causing electrons to rain down and producing the pretty waves of light that we all know. However, subsequent investigations have determined that Steve is actually two separate phenomena occurring simultaneously, which makes it both an aurora and not an aurora. The green picket fence is a true aurora created by electrons raining down from the sun. However, the colorful purple arc comes from charged particles colliding in the upper atmosphere. The friction from these interactions heats the molecules and causes them to emit this beautiful wavy light. Much the same way electricity heats the filament inside an incandescent light bulb until it's hot enough to glow. The team of academics and citizen scientists decided to name the new phenomenon a Strong Thermal Emission Velocity Enhancement, or STEVE for short, as an homage to the original photographer 
photographers who made the investigations possible through their documentation. All that said, the next time a bunch of photographers discover something new in the sky, Here's hoping they workshop the name a little bit longer. This next story is about a time where researchers thought they knew best, but ended up eating some fruity humble pie. The island of Borneo is in Southeast Asia and is home to over 50 different ethnic groups of people. Two of these groups, the Aban and Dusun people, recently shed light on a taxonomic mistake Western biologists had been making for almost 200 years. The first researcher to document the plants in the region wrote about a tree he called Artocarpus odoratissimus. They noted, however, that there was a lot of variety in this species of tree, with some having larger leaves and sweeter fruit than others. However, the Iban and Dusum people, who cultivated the trees, used different words to refer to the two kinds of tree. The Iban people called the trees with larger fruits and leaves lumok, and the ones with smaller, less sweet fruits pinjan. To see if this linguistic difference would be represented in the DNA, a team of researchers compared the genotypes of these trees and found that they were indeed genetically distinct species, instead of varying members of a single species. The authors note that the primary motivation for the genetic sequencing was the indigenous people's linguistic specification, and Iban and Dusun people were included in the study. It seems like those who have cultivated and ate the plant for generations knew much more than the botanists who occasionally came into the field. Who would have thought? Now, when trying to piece together the lives and practices of people long gone, we can sometimes turn to experimental archaeology. This often involves extensive research into the technologies available to people at the time, and an intimate knowledge of whatever literature is around. Which means that experimental archaeologists tend to be entrenched in their academic field of study. But in 2008, a Baltimore hairstylist made waves among those who study ancient Rome. When Janet Stevens first saw a bust of a Roman empress at a Baltimore museum, she was captivated by the woman's hairstyle. In order to figure out how the ancient Romans did it, she tried to recreate the ornate hairdo on her own, but didn't get very far at first. It wasn't until she tried sewing the braids of hair together with a needle and thread that she was able to replicate the empress's look. But to her surprise, there was no mention of hair sewing in any research about Roman hairstyling. Most archaeologists thought that these hairstyles were impossible to achieve with the wearer's own hair and could only be created using wigs. Following a hunch, Stevens decided to dig deeper and see if the archaeologists were missing something. Her research led her through 800 years of Roman texts describing various cosmetic practices, leading her to spot something that may have gotten lost in translation. During her research, she noted that the Roman word acus was generally being translated by scholars as a catch-all term for three distinct instruments, a hair bodkin, a needle and thread, and a hair curling iron. She eventually found sources that referenced its translation specifically as the same instrument that cloth menders used, in effect a needle and thread, which supported her claim that the Romans used sewing or weaving to create their elaborate hairdos. And in order to demonstrate her theory, she reproduced several complex ancient Roman hairstyles using multiple types of hair fasteners, identified Roman artifacts that could have gotten the job done, and even found historical cosmetic sets that included these same needles. Her research was published in the Journal of Roman Archaeology in 2008, making her only the second non-archaeologist to do so in the journal's history. The journal's editor even said of her work, I could tell even from the first version that it was a very serious piece of experimental archaeology which no scholar who was not a hairdresser, in other words, no scholar, would have been able to write. But all that said, the jury's still out on whether the Roman will ever be the next big trend in hair. Our last story isn't a singular discovery, and instead shouts out one of the largest and most impactful citizen science projects out there, which you can take part in too. But before we get there, a little background on how this project came to be. Right around the turn of the 20th century, it was a popular tradition in the United States to engage in a Christmas side hunt. During these hunts, opposing groups of hunters would compete to see whose side could shoot the most animals, usually birds and foxes. However, there was a young officer at the then-fledgling Audubon Society named Frank Chapman who proposed an alternative to the hunt. Instead of shooting at birds, what if we counted them? And so he organized the first ever Christmas bird census, which took place in the year 1900 on Christmas Day. 27 birders participated in various locations throughout the United States and Canada, counting up a total of 90 bird species. Over 100 years later, the bird count lives on, and the flock of bird brains participating has only grown. For starters, the count is now conducted over a three-week period from December 14th through January 5th. And around 
80,000 bird watchers sign up each year across Canada, the United States, Latin America, the Caribbean, and the Pacific Islands. In the 2018 to 2019 count, volunteers tallied more than 48 million birds from over 2,600 different species. And these bird counts aren't just for fun. Knowing what's up with bird populations helps conservation efforts across the globe. Researchers, conservation organizations, and government agencies all use the database to assess bird populations and help guide conservation efforts. To date, the Audubon Society claims that their database has been cited in over 300 peer-reviewed articles, all of which has come from the observations of citizen scientists. Science is about so much more than sitting in a lab and writing up papers. It's a process and a way of thinking about the world. And if you want to volunteer to do some science yourself, you can sign up for the annual Christmas bird count using the link below. But if you do find anything new out there, maybe pick a better name than Steve. So you too can be a scientist without the hefty price tag of a formal academic degree. And if the price tag is keeping you back from cloud computing as well, you might check out Linode Cloud Computing. Pricing should not be a barrier to the endless online tools that cloud computing gives you access to. That's why Linode, a cloud computing company from Akamai, lets you pay for the services that you need without bundling them under an unattainable price tag. Their prices are transparent and all listed on their website so you know what you're paying for and how much it costs before a single transaction. That tech helps you do things like watch SciShow for free, because everyone should be able to enjoy seeing the world complexly. And to make it even more affordable, Linode is giving SciShow viewers a $100 60-day credit on a new Linode account. To get that credit, just click the link in the description down below or go to linode.com scishow Thanks for watching, and thanks to Linode for supporting this SciShow video.